Welcome to Your Money Momentum, a podcast delivering information on personal financial planning, investing, and wealth management. Hosted by Global Wealth Advisors Tom Kennedy and Kevin M. Curley II, this show will feature market discussions, strategy, and practical advice aimed at building momentum with your money. Learn more and subscribe today at gwadvisors.net slash podcast. And now, here are certified financial planner professionals, Tom and Kevin. All right. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> you are listening to Your Money Momentum. My name is Tom Kennedy. I have Kevin Curley here, and we are doing our month review podcast, just finishing up October. Uh, Kevin, so what uh, what's happening? So much is happening, Tom. Uh, big month. I would say it was the end of the quarter, but it's actually the beginning of the fourth quarter. But seeing some massive sell-offs, some big changes, and lots to go through. So I, uh, I'm ready to hit the rundown when you are. Yeah, let's start with the equity market. So um, we just put strung together our third month in a row of negative returns um, on all the indices across the board, Dow, NASDAQ, and S&P. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I, I think it's just a, a little bit of an ease, a little bit of a sell-off. I think you've seen a lot of pressure. We saw oil prices rise for a while. Um, and they also saw the U.S. dollar rise a lot. And I think that has a big effect on equities. Um, we saw last year really pricing in a recession, and those drum beats are back again. And maybe this is the other kind of leg down to price in the recession that's coming sometime in 2024. Yeah, it's, uh, it, was a rough, it was a rough stretch, rough three months. Um, you know, I think a lot of it, the correlation is, is back again with, with, to your point, the dollar, but also interest rates. We saw interest rates jump up. They hit their, their highest level in a while. The 10-year touched 5%. Um, I think a lot of that is just there's a ton of supply being put out there. You have international money, Japan, China, redeeming our debt, flooding the market with treasuries. I think that's a big catalyst to driving these these interest rates higher. The Fed hasn't the Fed hasn't hiked. It's these longer term rates that's having a, a direct effect, a negative effect on the overall economy, in particular, uh, the market. Yeah, things are finally slowing down, despite the fact we got a pretty high GDP. Uh, print, which we discussed. Um, if you look at just kind of a broad measure of stocks, you know, the S&P 500 for the month down like three and a half percent, small caps really taking a big hit at six and a half percent. You know, that's a, uh, I think you have to be careful with small caps. Some of them have ETFs that have only profitable companies and some that don't have to be profitable. And you saw kind of a flight to quality or to value as well. So companies with better cash flow, they actually make profits held up better than that. So that's been the playbook for most of the year is owning quality and then the Magnificent Seven. And I think it's kind of just a continuation of that theme. Yeah, you know, I, one reason why small caps really take it on the chin when, when rates go up is because most small caps, well, they're they're started with, with financing. Um, they, need, they need to borrow debt to grow. Um, they don't have the cash flow that these larger cap companies do. They're not as... Um, they're not as developed. So when rates go up, uh, financing costs go up. And that's a big line item in the, in the bottom line when you're looking at small cap companies. So it's been a big discrepancy between the Magnificent Seven and the rest of the stock market. In fact, you know, more than half of the stocks in the S&P 500 are actually down year to date. Um, and it's just those seven, maybe eight stocks that are really, really driving the returns. Holding the weight of the world on their shoulders, um, but ha- styles mattered as well. So one of the things that has been popular the last kind of decade is factors, and so things like quality, volatility, momentum, dividend yield. Uh, if you look at that just year to date, quality is up a significant amount, over 17%. Volatility, minimum volatility, or low volatility stocks, they're doing well as well. Momentum, it's been bad, and it's been bad for three years. It's been better than bonds, but it's been bad. And even high dividend yielding stocks, uh, those are down a lot. So Anything that you know kind of has had a good year is now struggling. But I'd focus really on the interest rate sensitivity. You saw real estate and utilities, as far as sectors, have the worst time year to date. And meanwhile, things like communication services, information technology, consumer discretionary stuff that's less reliant on financing, uh, they're doing really well. And then somewhere in the middle is everything else. So anything is cyclical. So your industrials, your energy, materials, financials, those things are just kind of kind of putzing along, kind of not doing a whole lot at all. 
Yeah, speaking of interest rate sensitivity, bonds. Um, bonds are in the longest drawdown, 39 months and counting. Um, the set, you know, by far the longest in history. The second longest being back in the early 80s, there was 16 months. So you look at three-year returns off on bonds, they're they're negative, which is really really it's awful. Big negative too, like five six percent per year for three years. It's it's you know your safe investments, and I think we might have mentioned this on the on the last call. But I mean, you have things like TLT, which is the twenty year Treasury ETF, ten and twenty year Treasury ETF, <laughs> more volatile than asset classes like you know cryptocurrencies. So it's really, it's uh, I don't know if it, if the if the pain has been felt and the pain is done, or if this if, if bonds are broken. But I think we can um, we can continue that conversation. Yeah. Uh, surprisingly, though, if you look at housing prices, they hit an all time high in August. And so the reason we bring up August for a November uh, release is very simple. They have delays in the data. And so home prices hit a record in August, despite interest rates. Uh, this is a time where everybody's in money markets. Cash is king. Uh, but houses still go up. Yeah, I think there's 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 a lagging effect with with the housing market. It's I'm actually surprised prices have stayed where they're at based on interest rates. And it's like we talked about before, you have that lock in effect. No one's the supply is still very low. It's extremely low because people aren't selling. They're not trading in their three percent rate for an eight percent rate. Uh, builders aren't building as much because the cost to borrow um, is much, much higher and it's not as attractive. So you have this supply effect and demand has kind of stayed stagnant, which I think is going to keep prices. I don't think you're going to see a, a 15, 20 percent crash in, in, in housing prices. I think there'll be pockets of it maybe around the country where job growth is scarce. But it's it's amazing how prices have kept up when you have mortgage applications, the lowest level since 1995, I want to say, or 94, I think the stat was. Yeah, I, along those lines, I think that people haven't been scared away by interest rates as much because they expect them to eventually go back down. And if you're somebody who's applying now getting a 7 or 8% mortgage rate, your likelihood of refinancing at some point in the next 10, 20, 30 years is uh, really, really high, like well above 90% chance that rates at some point during the life of that loan will be much lower than 7 or 8%. And so I think some buyers are saying, well, I'll pay this for a couple of years and then I'll refinance, which can be a dangerous game. So make sure you can afford your monthly payments. But Otherwise, if you're taking a loan at eight just to get in the house, it can be okay when interest rates fall and you're in refinancing it for five percent, and you know now you have a monthly payment that's more manageable. Yeah, and and speaking of speaking of refinancing, kind of to, to switch gears on the uh, on the corporate side, you have this massive massive debt wall that I, I haven't heard too much talk about it as of late, mm -hmm. but you have trillions of dollars coming due in 2024 and 2025. With these loans that were issued years ago, um, next to nothing, where interest rates were low, are all coming due. These companies are going to have to refinance at much, much higher rates. So let's rates drop uh, drastically in the next six to twelve months. I think there's going to be some more, some more pain to come um, on, on the on the corporate side. Yeah, recently, uh, well, each day of the week, the Financial Times has a whole section called the Big Read, and the most recent week was one all about that rolling over the corporate debt and talking about how much of there is and how much has to be structured. Uh, and it is exactly what you call it, a debt wall. And it's going to be hard for them to get over. Um, and this is a time where interest rates are higher. So what I saw was that interest, sorry, uh, money market funds hit a record of over 5.5 trillion in assets. Uh, that's a huge number. And I also saw that institutional investors are holding over 20% in cash. Uh, you know, let's get some commentary on that. And then I have some follow-up questions. I mean, 5.5 trillion, that, that's a lot of cash on the sidelines, Tom. Why, why, why wouldn't you? When you have money markets paying five and a half, that's pretty, that's pretty sexy to me, in my opinion, in this type of environment. <laughs> when, you're, when, you, when, you, when you don't know what's going on, you got valuations, you got, you got the S&P almost at, you know, not far off from all-time highs of 4,800. Um, it just it just starts to look attractive and there's there's going to be this there's there's this break even point where people are fleeing bonds or going into money markets but there's going to be a point where rates get high enough where bonds are going to look really really attractive at these current rates and you're going to have a natural bid and demand so i think there is going to be some sort of ceiling on on interest rates interest rates are going to go up until you're just going to have a massive bid and a lot of buyers come in both institutional sovereign wealth funds pension funds endowments retail and that's going to naturally suck out the supply that the fed and others have been have been dumping into the market when you take out the supply the demand goes up and 
as demand goes up, prices go up, and the inverse happens with with rates. The the rate rates will will go down, regardless of what the Fed does. I don't care what the Fed does. It's it's why you have flat curves, inverted curves, uh, straight curves. It's it's what the back end of the curve does in the longer term rates. Um, I'm keeping an eye on. I think there's going to be a, a time where it's just going to look really really attractive. I mean, look at municipals, tax free. You can get. I mean, the rates are getting up there. Yeah, tax equivalent yields are over seven or eight percent, depending on how far out you want to go on uh, your maturity levels. I think that this is a good pausing point to talk about our five good minutes topic, which this month is reinvestment risk. <laughs> reinvestment risk. Um, Tom, think we can do five minutes on reinvestment risk? Yeah, yeah, kick, kick it off. All right. So, so let's let's define it, which is something you were just getting into, which is rates are high right now, and a lot of people are hiding out in government money market accounts. Why does that matter? Well, each month, sometimes more often, sometimes less often, they're going to change the rate that they pay you out. So if the Federal Reserve cut rates or prevailing interest rates, especially on the long end, were to fall a lot, you're suddenly going to go from getting 5% on an annualized rate to maybe 4 or 3.5%. Uh, you know, every time we have a Fed meeting or a Fed release, or recently it's been more the inflation releases, 20 30% sorry, basis point moves happen across the entire Treasury curve. So if that's happening at the Treasury curve, all of these other products are going to be priced accordingly. So you may wake up on a Tuesday, rates are at five, and on Wednesday, they're at 4.8. So you've now lost the chance to go invest at those higher levels. Let me give you a real life example. So this summer, uh, the UK market's called GILTS. It's the equivalent of their kind of their short term notes uh, for our US treasuries. Their two year yielded five and a half percent. That was back around July or August. It's now down to four and a half percent. So if you were investing back then, you could invest at five and a half percent for two years, which is pretty good. You're guaranteed that. A few months later, when you go to do it, you're only getting four and a half. Now, if you have a million dollars, that ends up being a lot of money. If it's, let's say, a hundred thousand dollars to make it more reasonable, you're going to lose out on a tremendous amount of interest just by waiting around. And this is important because everybody sitting in government money markets, uh, it's great deal today. But a year from now, prevailing interest rates are at two or three. You could have locked in a U.S. Treasury, a U.K. gilt, something else that's also safe for four years, five years, seven years, 10 years, and guarantee yourself four, five, six percent uh, for the next decade, as opposed to sitting in cash equivalent of the money market for 5%. And you might not have that months from now or a year from now. Yeah, I think it'd be fair to say, just to sum it up, that a money market is a 30-day rate. Uh, it typically changes every 30 days up or down or stays flat, depending on where the Fed funds rate is. And to your point, a year from now, the treasury market or the bond market is pricing in almost a 1% cut from where we're at today is from the last numbers I looked at, which you'd be at, if you're at five and a quarter in a money market, 5.3, you're at now 4.3. So to your point, now the give and take is you have you have full liquidity, full flexibility. You're not locked in. You can go in and out of that. Whereas you buy a two-year bond or a three-year bond or a 10-year bond, you're locked in for that that duration, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because, again, locking yourself in to get 5% with, you know, most would call risk-free with, with treasuries, meaning they're not going to they're not gonna default. You will have some fluctuations as rates go up and down, but the idea is to hold it to maturity anyway. Uh, it's, not, it's not a bad idea. I think that time's coming soon. I think you're starting to see people dip back in to the bond market to take advantage of that. And reinvestment risk goes both ways. You know, we, you want the opposite to be true with when you when you have debt. You want the lowest rate locked in for the longest period of time. Um, yeah, so, I've got a good story from Howard Marks' recent memo. He talked about coming of age as far as an investment back in the 70s and 80s. And he said, I think it was an aunt. He was having dinner. It was like a Thanksgiving meal, some type of big meal, a lot of people at the table. And she was more or less, you know, not bragging, but let everybody know what a great investment she just made. She bought a CD, incredibly safe, backed by the FDIC, et cetera. And she locked in a 17% rate. And he said to her, well, what are the five-year and the seven-year pay? She says 14%. It's like, well, you should have done that. He goes, why? I'm getting 7%, 17% this year. He goes, yeah, but 17% this year is great for one year. You could have locked in 14% for five years or seven years. You And she didn't understand the value of, getting that lower rate for more years. And it's really just the effect of compounding. So if you can keep a higher rate for longer, that's going to end up being a lot better than kind of doing what a lot of bond traders are going to have to do over the next few years, which is just relative value, saying that, yeah, treasuries are good today. Uh, if they go down, they'll just kind of go to high yield or they'll go to leverage loans or they'll do something else, just kind of where the rel- relative value is. If you're an individual investor, you need to think longer term of how long can I get this four, five, six 5%, 6% rate if you can get it for five or seven years, that can make a really nice impact on your ultimate 
underlying performance. You know, you, you bring up a good point too. You have this, you have this, the, the, the biggest thing about reinvestment risk is just that in five years when those bonds mature that you're picking up right now at 5%, when that money matures, you need to go back in the market and buy a new bond. Well, that new bond might now be at two and a half or three percent, or it could be higher if rates continue to go up. I doubt it, but it could be a lot lower. So if you're depending on that income stream as part of your fixed income for retirement, you're really the big challenge for you, the big hurdle is this reinvestment rate. When these bonds do mature, going back into the market at where current rates are, and you can take a big cut and pay, which is why you don't put everything obviously in one basket. You know, other sources of, of income. Um, and pension streams, if you will. But uh, that's, I think, I think that is reinvestment risk rate, reinvestment <laughs> rate risk in the nutshell. Valley sells seashells down by the seashore, right? <laughs> but I, I think that uh, it's something that's often overlooked. And there's a few reasons why one for 15 years, it hasn't really been a thing with interest rates at zero. You know, the future always looks brighter. The other part is that I don't think investors feel the same pain of missing out on gains the way they do when they hit losses. And reinvestment risk is really saying you're going to miss out on future gains by taking kind of the safe, easy 5% today. Go ahead and stretch a little bit, go out further on the duration, and you might be locked in at a higher rate for longer. Um, the other thing you could do is consider a strategy like a barbell where you're buying some of the short term, like money markets, and some of the kind of intermediate or longer duration. And that way you have both sides. And if rates go up, then great, you can invest some of that short-term money into more long-term as it keeps going, and you're protected for some of those losses. And if rates go down, you're still benefiting from the drop in rates on the long end, and you still have the opportunity to invest. And you know you didn't make as much on the short end, but you made a lot more on the long end because bonds will price according to prevailing interest rates. So it's a little different than CDs in the sense, or money markets in the sense that you know you can get that bond gain just by rates changing uh, as they you know rise or fall. You might be able to capture that loss or gain versus the CD. It is what it is. There's not a whole lot to it. Yeah, and, and what you're describing is bond laddering. And it's we haven't talked about it in probably over 15 years because of how low rates have been. But it's an actual proven – I mean, it's a strategy that works. And it works really well if you do it effectively and you know how to ladder out the bonds. Um, and, it, and I think it's good for a portion, a good portion of the portfolio depending on what your age is, target, of income, et cetera. So – yeah. And, the, and then the other piece I would say, is you mentioned municipal bonds, uh, there's some really great opportunities, I think, in municipal bonds because so many of them looked out across the landscape a few years ago and said, we can borrow money for 2% or 3%. Let's issue as much debt as we can. And now because of interest rates rising, some of that debt is priced at you know, 60, 70% of par value, but the coupon's 2%. So the city or municipality or the toll road, whoever it was that issued those, they're going to only pay 2%. Yet you might be able to pick up 5% and on a tax equivalent yield, you know, might be it's worth seven and a quarter to 8%. So they're not going to refinance those because who's going to cash in two when prevailing interest rates are five or six, even if rates go down, they're unlikely to go back down to zero. So some of those cities and municipalities that issued it too, they're not calling those bonds because they want to pay 2% forever. But you as an investor, because of rising rates might have a chance to pick up a really nice thing and you don't have to worry about getting called on them. Right, right. And there's, you know, you have general obligation, you have revenue, which is backed by the revenue of the municipality. And in general, historically, they have lower default rates, you know, per their, per mm -hmm. their credit quality versus their taxable counterparts. And default rates right now, not that they can't pick up. I mean, that's one of the risks of buying an individual bond is that you don't get paid back at maturity because the company or municipality that you invested in goes bankrupt. Um, default rates are at all time lows. So the, 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 the biggest risk is if you have to get out of that bond before the maturity ends and rates are up and your bond prices are down and you take a loss. But if you can hold to maturity, you're going to clip your clip your yield, get your coupon um, and, and let it roll off. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense right now based on the low risk of default, especially the municipal side and where rates are at. Yeah, so Moody's has a report you can find on their website. It's over 100 pages long, but I read it on a flight recently because the flight seemed to take a lot longer than I realized it was going to be. And they found about, um, we'll call it about once a year on average, they tended to be a default. Uh, and it's really kind of depends on the sector. So they had a lot of problems with healthcare related entities as well as housing, kind of public housing type of projects. Uh, otherwise, they really don't default. And they found that within the prior year before default, it had to be rated BA2 or worse, or they just 
really don't default. It's incredibly rare. There were some exceptions like Orange County defaulted, even though they had a high credit rating. Yeah. Um, and it was done more as a strategic option. They had a lot of um, kind of Catholic municipalities that were concerned about some of their liability that defaulted in advance just to kind of negotiate with creditors. So outside of a couple of strategic ones, uh, the risk of default is incredibly low. And look, if you own a sewer or a municipality water system, uh, they just raise the taxes because people are going to still need those two things. And for general obligations, you know, the only it's not even a state, but Puerto Rico has been the only one that's really had a major problem. Uh, often cited are Illinois and California for ones that are at risk. But by and large, states, municipalities, they hit their budgets, they pay their bills, uh, and they tend to be pretty highly rated. So if you're looking for something to avoid reinvestment risk and you want some higher quality than maybe some corporations offer, uh, munis can be a really great choice. Yeah, and I'll finish, I'll end on this with the default stuff. It's like an upside down hockey stick. The closer you get to maturity, the lesser and lesser likelihood of that bond defaulting. And not only that, but even if the if the issue does default, um, as far as creditors go, you're you're almost at the top of the list. So you're getting it's not defaulting, you're getting zero back. You might get sixty, seventy cents on the dollar. So it's not like it's defaulting and you're getting nothing. You are recouping some of that some of those funds back. So to your point, not that it can't happen, not that it can't go to zero. Not that the defaults can't pick up across the board. It's just historically highly unlikely, and it's been a great place to to generate some tax-free income. Yeah, and uh, look, there's a lot of detail and nuance to it, so make sure you work with an advisor or somebody very qualified before you go and just buy a bunch off the shelf. But um, that was that was great. Should we move on to some bold predictions? Let's do it. Get your future freezing cold takes as we launch into our latest series of... Old predictions. All right, Tom. Last month I told you CJ Stroud was going to be rookie of the year. He's thrown for like a dozen more touchdowns. He beat the Bengals last week. He uh, had an unbelievable comeback in a game the week prior to that. So, you know, that one's looking good. You got any uh, good futures bet for me for Heisman or any awards in the NFL? You know, I think uh, I think you're right with TJ Stroud. I mean, that, those two last couple of games were really, really, really impressive. I think he beat up McCombs for for rookie thrown yards um, in a single game, which was really impressive. And coming back under pressure like that, um, you know, bold predictions. You know, unfortunately, uh, my Colorado Buffaloes aren't, aren't looking too hot. Uh, you know, I thought no bowl I, game. I, I don't think they're going to get a bowl game. It's not. It's not really a bold prediction. It's pretty. It's pretty apparent at this point. But. Uh, that's uh, that's all I got for you. Is I'm, I'm pretty upset about my Buffaloes. All right. Well, as far as markets go, how about a bold prediction on whether or not rates have peaked? I don't think they've peaked. Um, I, I want. I, I would love and I would want to think they they've peaked, but I think you still have. I think you still have more to go. I don't think that that buying has started yet. And you're, you have the Treasury that's still unwinding, that's still selling. You have. I mean, you look at, and I haven't fact-checked this yet, but just international money, China, Japan, just dumping treasuries, that that, that yen carry trade's unwinding. It's not as attractive as it was. So without a natural buyer and a ton of money out there, I think rates are going to continue to go up. Now, the Fed funds rate, I do think, is... Is peaked. I don't think the Fed's gonna. I don't think the Fed's gonna raise from here. I don't think they're gonna cut as soon as everyone thinks, or the bond market's saying they're gonna cut. But I think they're they're done on the raise. Yeah, I uh, I think the market thinks they've peaked. I, I do think inflation's still a problem, and if it does kind of roar back up a little bit higher, I think you'll see them raise rates a little further. But uh, I'll go with your prediction that it, it, it it's basically done, but not maybe quite done. <laughs> I like the non-committal answer. So. Um, next time we'll be talking about the central banks. We'll get through the Fed, the Bank of Japan, which you alluded to. Uh, we'll talk about maybe some end of the year planning or some tax changes coming up. Uh, so join us for our mid month pod coming up soon. All right. Thanks, Tom. You've been listening to your money momentum brought to you by Global Wealth Advisors. To learn more about GWA and its talented roster of financial professionals, head on over to GWAdvisors.net. Thanks. And we'll see you next time on your money momentum. All indices are unmanaged and investors cannot invest directly into an index. Certain sections of this commentary contain forward-looking statements that are based on reasonable expectations, estimates, projections, and assumptions. Forward-looking statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve certain risks and uncertainties, which are difficult to predict. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Diversification does not assure profit or protect against loss in declining markets.